you wanted to know whether we were here. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay. You're there. Okay. So the way this works, um, I want a full page. How do we get a full page? Hmm. I sure wish I could learn this better. All right. You can read this when you when I send it to you because the first part of this is just telling you it's simply telling you about how this came about. We had a retreat for about 17 people who were pretty advanced okay and those people they were down in uh, we had the retreat in po Penang, but it's in a place called Pohang Hill. Can you watch this for me? Please? I'm sorry who's talking. Please turn your mic off. Okay. So, uh, so what happened was uh, they got in a discussion when we were doing the answers to the questions one night, okay? And um, the question popped up by a really bright person. You know, there's laws to physics, laws to mathematics, laws in science, his scientists, you know? And he said, are there any laws for meditation? So we decided, well, what would be considered a law first? And the first thing we look at when we say we're going to try to figure out if there's laws that are always precisely the same, we're going to make that a criteria. It, it always, it's always the same. It always works this way. Why don't you want to let me grab this? Okay, there you go. It's always, it, the criteria is that it's always going to work this way. And if we follow this law, when I was sitting there today, I was thinking to myself, it's going to protect us. So now one of the laws that isn't here, and someone should take a note to remember this, may take a note down. One of the laws that's on here, we didn't put on here, is the law of the precepts. Because number one, all we ever hear is Bhante saying, if you, if you, you know, if the hindrances are coming up, the first thing, if they weren't coming up, and then all of a sudden they're coming up, the first thing you need to ask yourself is, you know, what happened here? And um, what happened? And, um, what happened is it's really hot. Just a second. Okay. <clears throat> what happened here is that if we follow the precepts, that's one of the protections for the hindrances not to come hit us. Okay. So number one, you look at your hindrance situation and we have had wonderful examples of this where a woman who was an extremely good meditator, uh, you know, went away and stopped meditating for a while and came back and could not meditate very much time at all. And when Bhante said, well, what we need to do is we need to look and see what precept you broke. And she became indignant, upset that we would even consider that she had broken a precept. But when she went home and then thought about it, she figured out she did break a precept. She was doing something intentionally to a colony of ants in the kitchen. She was trying, getting very upset with them. And instead of persuading them to leave the kitchen, she started killing the ants. And she was feeling very guilty about this because she knew that when she was doing that, there was a lot of anger. And it doesn't have to be much, but it gets stuck in your head. And then what happens is when you're practicing, it's gonna come up and it's gonna, it's gonna bother you. It's gonna get you upset. In her case, whenever that came up in her mind, it made her very tight and then she couldn't proceed and she broke her sittings and she wanted to quit because before she was an easy two hour, easy two or three hour sitter. And now she couldn't sit for more than 30 minutes. This is how bad it had gotten. So once she cleared this up um, and, and cleared away this problem by seeing what it was and then practicing giving some life, buying some fish, setting them loose, that sort of thing, and clearing this away and clearing away. I took life, now I'm giving some life back. Okay, then she sat and things were cleared because she really, that's, this is, watching this work was really fascinating for me to see how real it was. So we really have to have one here that we should add. The other thing, uh, that's about the precepts and basically the five precepts. But in another pre another discussion we had in 128, we were looking at 11 precepts. And in, I think the Bayabara was Sutta in number four, you find 
something like 16 examples of things. Some of them are repeated, but there's a list of 16, I think. And so uh, different ways of handling the precepts. But now, uh, like I said, what we're going to concentrate on is us. How do we prepare ourselves the best that we can for sitting in meditation in order to be set up so that the hindrances won't pop? So you, let's say you're keeping your precepts. Okay, your meditation object, you, the objective of your, um, of the objective of attitude. Now, what happened was in this list, we had changed it around several times, but what I ended up calling them were your meditation objective attitude, your mental attitude, your object attitude, your attitude towards your object. You might want to rephrase it. We can work on this as a group because 17 of us worked on this to come this far. And I think what we came up with was, um, let's see, I think there's, um, there's 11 of them here. Okay. And then um, so let's just go through these first and then we can, then we can talk about them as we go. Okay. So the first one is your meditation objective attitude means to see clearly how everything works by observing and comprehending the four noble truths, dependent origination and the three characteristics right there. It's telling you, you need some knowledge about these things and how they work. And you need to be, be tuned in on that with the intention to reach the final objective of total release from suffering and complete abandoning the trap of the wheel of samsara, which is being reborn over and over again into different li human lives to continue suffering and be caught. And the reason that happens is because no one tells you what's really going on. And each time you're, you, know, you suffer from this ignorance, you don't know what it is, the highest goal in uh, for the Buddhist to accomplish is the supramanane nibbana and the fruition, the, the high, the arahat level. Okay, but you get so much freedom and everything is reduced systematically from the point where you're practicing and then in sodapana, sodapana fruition, little by little, the fetters are disappearing. But the, all the knowledge that you have, you guys have a lot of knowledge now. So what I'm trying to do is show you how to how we can tune it. Now, having the knowledge is one thing. You read a book, you can say, hey, I read that book. <laughs> then you have the book and you read it and maybe you played a few scales. <laughs> but uh, I remember guitar, we had a lot of people looked at a guitar book and then they said, we can play. And you know, they, and they couldn't really do much with the guitar, but they were happy, they were happy. But the more, once you have knowledge, it's how you use it and develop it to the point of wisdom. And then wisdom says, I have this knowledge. Now I have the wisdom how to use this knowledge. And so to take the knowledge in this case, the more you understand, the more, the better your practice is becoming, the operation of the practice to let you see. So that's your basic objective. And that's always the same. That's sitting there. Okay. So you need to, if you're really sitting seriously for, for, I know people sit for a lot of different reasons in meditation, but if you are sitting for this particular thing, it's good to have this firmly in your mind. Second one was we, we accepted this when we said the mental attitude. Now, what this is talking about, mind is the forerunner of all states. Mind is chief. Mind made are all wholesome or unwholesome states. So we're saying, there's another way I could add a sentence here and say, the mind that is the uh, control room <laughs> for the whole body and basically for everything that happens. So in the tranquil wisdom insight meditation, we practice to see, but fully comprehend and escape the from the suffering. See it, comprehend it, and escape from the suffering. We aim to experience cessation from suffering on a daily basis, really. We secure this knowledge in our minds by observing the very heart of the problem, by watching how mind's attention impersonally moves. And this is the way we can see up close how everything works as an, it should say, an impersonal process. It's an impersonal process. 
we that's our mental the mental framework we go into we should also go into our practice um you know the um go into the practice we say faith in buddhism is not a um the same kind of faith that we have in other we find in other religions blind faith meaning we can't prove it okay we're not trying to do that with faith here. We ask you as a more basic, simple faith, sort of like, I'm going to teach you to ride a bike. I want you to start out by believing that you can do it. And I'm going to show you how to do it. So in this case, I'm teaching you meditation. I want you to believe the Buddha actually found something. That's the only place. This is the only place I'm asking you to start out with, not believe it, but faith, have faith that he really did find something in the six and a half years he went on a search for and then wrote all these suttas and everything and taught other people something that helped them get free. And the more you can verify that, the stronger that faith is that this is it. And when you practice and you start to see actual results you can share with people, it's really fantastic. And um, the, that builds your faith, your confidence, level just leaps when that happens and you have faith when you see other people succeed and get free from their suffering is quite remarkable okay now then so this one this next one is the law saying your object attitude what do i mean by that well sometimes people have the wrong attitude about the object in meditation and we looked at that and we said if you think this object of meditation, whatever you have chosen to use is, act, is going to give you an answer. It's not going to give you an answer, okay? It's there for another reason. So let's look at what happened here. What was the real purpose of having an object to use in, you could even say in any meditation? The object has two practical purposes during an investigation of states during meditation. This is what we all agreed upon. First, it serves as an anchor, meaning it is your home base to return to. And whenever mind's attention moves, is mo moving away from the, uh, moves away, um, it has something to come back to. In this way, you, are using the object for a recentering point to continue your investigation. That's what the object is. An object has no information about how to get to Nibbana. It doesn't. It doesn't teach you anything. It doesn't jump up and say, hi, I'm the object. Really glad you're here. Keep watching me. I'll tell you the secret. If you keep watching me hard enough, I might even talk. You know, it's, it's not like that. Okay. Secondly, Okay, although the object has no information of primary value, it does help you see how this moving away happens. It allows you to watch that happen enough each time in the very same way. And it never changes. Uh, this never changes. This involves you moving uh, your attention away from your investigation to something else for your own observation, involvement, engagement, okay? And even an investigation. And if you are not trained how the hindrances work, you'll do that. This is another point when we're talking about the object and we're talking about the hindrances. There's another thing I want to say. Uh, this hindrance, it's we want to we talk about the hindrance all these books written about the hindrance came the hindrance bothered me it's the hindrance's fault why did you stop your meditation hindrance made me do it you know it's like the devil made me do it. the hindrance made me do it and yet if i started laughing at this this afternoon that poor little hindrance did not do anything to you isn't that amazing it did not do anything to you what actually happened was something different. And this is something that we didn't talk about back then, but this is what I realize now. When you fall off course, this is the place that you are to come back to that object. It's, that's what it means by anchor. You come back to that place, okay? And uh, you keep going. 
don't blame yourself when you move your, you move your attention away. Don't take it personally. Just never mind it. Let it go. Relax, smile, and come back and continue your investigation with a smile. Because after all, whatever you're doing, whether it's a meditation or a task or anything, it has that beginning, that middle, and that end every single time. And that is witnessing a Nietzsche. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, right. A Nietzsche. Impermanence. You're seeing the, um, the impermanence, how whatever you're doing, no matter how hard anything is to go through in life, it, it's, it, it's whatever's going on. If you just remember that in the back of your head somewhere in the mind, this is, this is not going on. And now it's beginning to happen. And now we're in it. And then it's going to be over no matter what it is, even if the big hole in the road swallows your car. <laughs> you know, it's still, it doesn't matter. We like potholes around here are so big. Sometimes I'm afraid that the whole car is going to disappear. Okay. But the, what I'm trying to tell you about the hindrance is innocent. What I mean is then who is guilty? That's what somebody said. If the hindrance, it's not the fault of the hindrance that I was pulled away then what happened okay here we go um your mindfulness slipped so your mindfulness was your observation watching what's happening inside it slipped and something when you're inside and there's like a black screen in front of you and you're trying to see if there's anything going to happen there at all if something happens from the side to come up and you were to leave your spiritual friend, something inside happened or a thought came up or anything, something has to happen in order for you to move, the attention to move. It didn't just, you know, the hinge didn't come and grab you and pull you over there. It didn't do that. It's innocent. So your attention and interest and your observation stopped on your object on in the case of the spiritual friend you, you lost interest in your friend and you left them because why that wonderful human thing you actually see this in animals too mammals you can watch it too curiosity in young animals watch kittens sometime oh wow you know curiosity human beings are sub subjected to this curiosity too and you were so curious that all of a sudden you went from here over there so actually you left, but for some reason, because we've written so much about the hindrance being the devil, hindrance is like a, a war coming to you to attack you. And we blame everything on the hindrance when actually we have this information. So the more we put that on paper and check before we sit down, you know, do I understand my object? Do I like my friend? Do I really want to send a wish to my friend? Do I respect them? And I'm really going to stay with them until they smile back. Can you do that? Okay, because if something comes up or some thought or even a sensation or anything, are you going to leave the friend behind? Because the question is, when they talk to me and uh, write me on online, which is all about this hindrance, my question back to them, where's your friend? <laughs> and then they go, you know, I left them back there. I'm wanting to know what this is instead. See the problem? Okay. So the next one is Atta attitude. It's you, you need to understand. It's a funny thing that Buddha didn't tell you everything right straight out. He left certain things for you to figure out for yourself. He's a genius the way he did this. So we came up with craving is the cause of suffering because he, he writes that way. But many of us understand ignorance is part of it but we shouldn't get upset about being ignorant because it's not our fault nobody told us about this because nobody realized it and before centuries people are walking around us as children and we grow up with people who um are behaving and that's how we learn our patterns of behavior by imitating them it's the mirror the mirror uh thing that is going on with growing up that, and I tell parents who talk to me about my children are such a problem, such a problem. I said, okay, what are, do first, if it's young people with their young children and the children are misbehaving, go upstairs, one, you can do it, the father and the mother, one or the other. Stand in front of the mirror for a while and think about what you say during the day and what you do. 
and then take a look at what you're objecting to in the children and then you can be able to straighten this out and usually they can because they were saying things or doing things certain ways that they were angry that the children were saying things and doing things particular way but it's only because the children are mirroring that's how we're we're learning so much okay so your atta attitude is so important to figure out because this atta is what ignites or it i like ignites better than triggers but it triggers the craving it ignites it so that it starts to get hot you see because when you look on the on the um, dependent origination chart on your seven link training chart you and, and by the way if people are here and listening and they haven't got the charts then you need to write me a note say i don't have the chart will you send it to me i'll send you the 12 links and i'll send you the seven link those two charts so you can begin to see that craving is the first part of the red zone and i probably should make another chart that says red zone on the top but from craving clinging habitual tendency for reaction and the birth of reactions that's the red zone that's where all the suffering really hits hard before that contact yeah if it happened and a feeling comes up it's just pleasant or painful and it's part of the physical anatomy of the human being it's i'm not there that's something that happens within my my bodily uh, system, okay? And um, people will say when they're advanced meditator, very advanced, they'll say, well, I can see the eye that I, the, the eye is there in the feeling, but I'm talking about obvious stuff. And when you watch, where you can watch is, you can observe contact feeling happening, but you're not there, you're just watching it happen. And then I like it or I don't like it is the first opinion. That's what I'm saying. And that triggers the beginning of the red zone and the clinging compounds it. Why do you like it? Or why do you not like it? Turns it into, I want it, an attachment, or I don't like it, uh, I, I don't want it, aversion, see? And then it jumps again into the habitual emotional reaction and that those emotions come out. And this is also the place, uh, the red zone, where you can identify for yourself, okay, that emotions are not feelings. Feelings and emotions are different. Feelings, just a feeling, emotions have names. And that's how you f figure this out. Oh, you can write a little note for yourself and tell me the names of all the different emotions, you see? Um, being anxious, anxiety, depression, sadness, grief, all these things, those are states of emotion. But feeling is pleasant or painful that leads into the other ones, you see? Okay, so the atta ignites the craving. Atta is the mistaken idea, a concept of a personal self. But here's the key to understanding what it is. The consequences of this false idea leads us to believe that everything happening through any one of our sense doors is part of us. We believe it is part of me. It's me, it's mine, it's myself, it's who I am. That's what happens in the suttas. Then we believe that this experience of life is coming down on me. It leads us to believe that things are happening to me. And this can make a person feel like you have the weight of the world on your head sometimes. I think it's where the story of Atlas came from, holding up the, you know, the earth. Probably the Greeks had this idea too. And then very easily you turn this idea into saying, I am to blame. I am, it, it's my fault. And then that slips into depression, the first levels of depression, anxiety, well, the tension, the stress, and then the anxiety. And that's all hooked into second, first and secondary diagnoses that go into the different levels of depression. All suffering comes to us in the form of personal desire to have something or to change something. Suffering always begins with me. 
I like it. I want it. Attachment. Or I don't like it. I don't want it. Aversion. Suffering becomes a very personal mental or physical experience and or, okay? And that's Atta, that's the problem. So the problem is universal with Atta, it's a fixed thing. Everybody faces it, but most people are unconscious it's happening because they don't have the information. <clears throat> okay, there. now the next one is your craving. Your craving attitude is important. Because if you don't know about craving, you're in hot water. <laughs> and I was in hot water for many years growing up. All right. Your craving attitude. Craving is the cause of suffering. Okay, this is true. There is no way that you can let go of craving unless you know what craving actually is, right? This is the biggest problem in Buddhist meditation today. Because if you ask a teacher, but tell me what craving is, they'll say, oh, it's desire. I have to go talk to this other person and they'll walk away. They don't say what it is. What you're really asking them is, what is craving? Craving is the I like it or the I don't like it mind. That's very clear. The I is there pushing it. That always manifests. That means comes up first as an increase in tension and tightness in the mind and in the body. Craving is an unwholesome mind state. To change a habit of arising unwholesome mind states, we are told to practice right effort. Go to 78, section 10. I'm not sure what that guy is in a minute. The six R's practice is designed uh, to complete the four steps of right effort. So let's look at 78, section 10 a second. Somebody pick that up for me. Yep. And in section 10, we find these same, these paragraph of, uh, I'll read it to you. What are the unwholesome habits? They are unwholesome bodily actions, unwholesome verbal actions, and evil lively, uh, livelihood or lifestyle. And they are called, called the unwholesome habits. And what do these unwholesome habits originate from? The origin is stated, they should be said to originate from the mind. What mind? Though mind is multiple, varied, and of different aspects, there is mind affected by lust, by hate, and delusion. This is Loba Dosa Moha. Um, and delusion is the moha is the the problem with the atta, the, the, the atta problem. Unwholesome habits originate from this. And where do these unwholesome habits cease without remainder? Their cessation is stated here. A student abandons bodily misconduct, develops good bodily conduct, abandons verbal misconduct, develops good verbal conduct, abandons mental misconduct, develops good mental conduct. He abandons wrong livelihood or lifestyle and gains a living by, um, by right livelihood. And we explain when we teach the Eightfold Path, well, why we say lifestyle is all the aspects of your living environment and work is included. It is here that unwholesome habits cease without remainder, okay? And then we have the, the paragraph is right here. And how practicing does he practice the way to the cessation of these unwholesome habits? Here, the student awakens enthusiasm for the non-arising of the unarisen evil unwholesome states. And he makes effort, he arouses energy, a balanced energy, exerts his mind, by practicing correctly, and he strives. He practices right effort, okay? He awakens the enthusiasm for abandoning them. So this is like first, th that part I just read is the recognizing, having knowledge of what it is, and you are exerting energy as you're practicing to continue to recognize it, okay? He awakens enthusiasm for the abandoning of the arisen evil unwholesome states, and he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. That's the second one. You abandon it, you release it and relax your head. The next one is he awakens 
enthusiasm for the arising of the unarisen wholesome states. So that's where you bring up the smile. You, you use your energy to, to uh, and exert your effort to bring up the smile each time as you're coming back. Why the smile? Because the smile is the quickest wholesome uh, thing that you can, wholesome state that you can bring up that immediately changes your mind. It immediately cancels it. Like if you're really angry, we tell you to laugh and smile. Can't be angry anymore. So in just like that, the anger is off. And then you proceed from there for the rest of the fix, the replacement. And the last part is he awakens enthusiasm for the continuance, non disappearance Listen carefully to the last one. He awakens his enthusiasm for the continuance of the wholesome state non-disappearance, strengthening, increase, and fulfillment. Strengthening and increase means keep creating wholesome states of mind that feel like that smile, okay? And fulfill and fulfillment by development of the arisen wholesome states. He makes an effort, arouses energy, exerts mind, strives. That whole thing I read you is just section 10 in Sutta number 78, okay? So there's your right effort. So that's what's talking about that one. And that's telling you how to fix this. The six R's practice is designed to complete the four steps of right effort and alleviate, not just, re, not just eliminate the craving. Always remember, this is part of your knowledge. You do not, the way we're teaching you, just let go of your bad habits or stop craving. It doesn't work because if you, are 40 years old and you're trying to practice, you have a record system in here and the universe knows it and it's gonna help you to bring it up again. And a matter of time after a retreat, you're gonna start doing what you did before, unless you do the last two steps. So what I'm telling you is right effort is useless with these four steps, okay? And you're doing these two, but then, oh, that's crazy. I have to do this mirror thing. It's really funny. May, you have to help me turn this around. It's driving me nuts. My pictures, I'm going this way and it's going that way. <laughs> I'm going to go bonkers. Anyway, you practice the first two steps to purify your mind and the second two steps to retrain it. You got that? And it actually, I think, May, this should be another law that the, the, the actual continuation is right effort only works if you're practicing all four steps of right effort. That should be another law, okay? Um, so that one is craving. Now we look at a Nietzsche and Nietzsche attitude. Now I'm not sure if the new part about this is here. So we have to look closely at this one. A Nietzsche of course means impermanence and it's referring to their universe and everything Everything in life is in a state of continuous flux and change. So whatever arises always passes away. Well, everybody knows that, okay. But every arising state we experience in meditation and every arising phenomena we experience in life, it is impermanent. Now, as you meditate, uh, everything keeps moving along the life continuum line and there is continuous change. So what's the note that was here? It becomes important to see the suffering is pleasant in pleasant states by witnessing their arising, existing, and vanishing. That's true. For instance, joy and happiness. Great to have it here. Or the unpleasant feelings that arise when hindrances come up, noticing that they too impersonally arise, exist, and they vanish. That's true. However, nobody says that Buddhists are not allowed to smile and be happy. Always remember that because it's part of the cure of this whole thing about suffering. And somehow this has gotten a little messed up across the centuries and changed. We actually, I met a couple this week and actually they were talking about the fact that we're not supposed to be uh, too happy. <laughs> it was that not when happiness is here take it but always understand anicca is the secret if you understand anicca it can be a comfort and not an enemy okay it's true when you get to be very advanced then you can look at the idea of 
for uh, going very advanced, like in the higher highest attainments, that you're not so interested in that anymore. That's all right. If you're going to go all the way, you let go of both sides of the street. But the average person doesn't need to be doing this. You see, in life, it's not meant to be happening because you want to learn to have this lightness and clarity in the mind. So a Nietzsche can be your friend. This is the thing. And Nietzsche can be uh, cause this suffering because you don't understand it. But once you understand it, how is a Nietzsche your friend? Well, I <laughs> was talking to you one night. There was a flood here in the apartment and it went through the bedroom and everywhere. And it was like buckets and buckets and buckets of water. And I thought the mopping would just never be done. Then I started laughing <laughs> and laughing because whatever happened, it wasn't here. I was walk, you know, cleaning it up and saying, well, it wasn't here, <laughs> now it's here and um, it's going to be finished. And so th it makes life a lot easier to teach children to understand this. Whatever's happening, if you're hurt, okay, you went out to play and now you got hurt. So now you rest you let, and it will heal. Your, your leg will heal okay. And then you go out and play again. Kids are great about that. But we lose that. We, we, we lose that flexibility the kids have about that. So a Nietzsche can be uh, frustrating for us, but a Nietzsche can also be a friend. When you're adjusting things in lockdown, a Nietzsche is a really good thing, it turns out, because people are stuck and caught in the environment, sometimes with people that they don't want to be the, with those people. And the key to this is always to remember this is not forever. This is not you know, and that you can change and leave the room or leave the area and stuff and you make adjustments. So it's difficult, yes, but it's not a total forever situation. That's the thing. The next one is a dukkha, dukkha attitude. And suffering is our personal unsatisfactoriness with what is in the present time and the untrained mind believes that everything is happening to me personally, coming down on me because of this Atta belief. Like I said, that's probably where Atlas and the holding up the earth came from. But because of the effect of Atta belief, we never figure out the secret. Nothing is happening to me. Everything is happening from me. This is so liberating when you figure this out. Extremely liberating. You should have signs all over your house. That's what I did. I was just in a trailer, but you know, on the ceiling, on the, on the walls, on the doors, by the windows. And I couldn't walk anywhere outside, even coming into this little room of mine that I was living in without seeing this a dozen times. When I walked in, nothing is happening to me. Everything is happening from me. That means you have a sense of control, truly a sense of control. If you understand how things work clearly, that's what's freeing up your mind. Under the weight of suffering, we don't realize that we have the capacity to change course and the power to set up our intention. And if we have proper knowledge about how things work, we can avoid and end our suffering. That's this one, okay? So that is why understanding how the, the suffering uh, is operating, when you just talk about suffering, it's a very scary thing, you know? But when you start to understand how the suffering is all broken down, you can go to 140 or 141, is actually going through every single part of what, uh, what is sorrow, then lamentation, pain, grief, despair, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. So it tells you in a paragraph for each one of those things. That's how detailed the Buddha was. And it tells you that the pain is having to do with your body and the grief is having to do with your mind, mental states. So he divided it into these wonderful two pieces, simple, not real complex and cop, that it got complex later on with the Abhidhamma studies and stuff. But in the, in the text, basically, it was wholesome or unwholesome mind, and it, it was this uh, suffering that existed 
that was physical or it was mental, okay? So suffering um, is our, uh, like I just did that, right? Okay, the personal dissatisfaction and then nothing is happening to me. Everything is happening from me. I was saying that all day long when I first realized that and carrying it with me in everything you're doing. The next one, number eight, is the anatta attitude. And the anatta uh, refers to the impersonal nature of everything. This is what you're actually trying to uncover and fully, completely understand. It concludes that upon realizing the vastness of the implication of an impersonal nature, we can extend this idea to ourselves and look more closely and perhaps find the antidote for, for the suffering. The personal perspective can lead you to an escape, and that should say impersonal. The impersonal perspective can lead you to an escape from suffering. Let's, let's just do that. I think we're allowed to do that. Yeah, we're good. Um, the um, impersonal uh, perspective can lead you to an escape from suffering in any situation that you were faced with within the world. Doesn't matter where you are, what you're doing. Doesn't matter. We need to keep on reminding ourselves constantly as a being, we are primarily an impersonal process with six operating systems inside and an outer covering the body itself, which forms our container. And these six systems can register as organic experiences due to internal or external contact occurring. The internal contact has to do with mind and thoughts and this other five sense doors, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, external experience in life, okay? Working from there with what you have now been taught about dependent origination and you've been told your mind, you told your mind this is a fact, you should then be able to giggle a bit <laughs> to yourself each time that you hear um, an internal or external thought say to you, I am disturbed. I dislike this feeling, sensation, smell, taste, or touch. Can you see the mistake that you are making? You have to practice this and catch how many times a day you do it. We had little notebooks we were walking around marking this down and talking to Bonte about it. You know, we're doing, how many times did you do that today? Get angry at yourself and come back on yourself, blame yourself. And how many times did you dislike something where you were not looking totally why did you dislike it what made it personal are you just reacting from past experiences so you take a look at the advice the buddha gave to his son venerable rahula in in, in majima nikaya number 62 regarding how he should not get personally disturbed about anything while he is in meditation instead he advised him to consider any distraction as an image of the earth, air, fire, or water would consider an, an attempted attack on them. Imagine that your mind as being water for that very instant a hindrance were to appear. Imagine that your observation could flow around the arising hindrance as if it were a barrier in front of you. It, it's just like the water flowing down a stream on the mountain. It goes around a rock. It can keep going just like the water flowing down a stream goes around a rock in its path. And you can meditate like water. That's what it means to meditate like water. Make a commitment to meditate like water. And the earth, the water doesn't fight back if something comes up like that. If you were to scream at the earth or stamp your feet or throw garbage on it, it doesn't punch you. <laughs> uh, actually, I sometimes think the mother, the earth is kind of kicking back, but uh, I don't think it's totally our 
what we've done alone. I think there's cycles for this too. The elemental similes that the Buddha used to instruct his son are found in Majjhima Nikaya number 62 in sections 13 through 17. And uh, try this kind of imagery in your own meditation sometime. The core message here is let go, relax, smile, and come back. Release, let go, relax, smile, come back. You keep doing that. So if you want to hear, if you have not heard it, but I, I will just read the one, one piece of it, that's all. They're going to show you in that sutta, the, in relation to the elements, he teaches, he's using the elements to teach his son. His son was 17 years old in that when he interrupted his breathing meditation and taught him this sutta. And when we go to, um, let's, here as you go, we'll do the one with the, with the earth so you can get an idea, but each one is the same. <clears throat> Rahula, develop meditation that is like the earth. For when you develop meditation that is like the earth, arisen, agreeable, and disagreeable contacts will not invade your mind and remain. Just as people were to throw clean things or dirty things, excrement, urine, spittle, pus, and blood on the earth, and the earth is not repelled, it is not humiliated, it is not disgusted. Because of that, Rahula, you can develop your meditation that is like the earth. And when you develop meditation like the earth, arisen and disagreeable contacts will not invade your mind and will not remain. That is the paragraph. And this is an example of something that you could take and memorize. And you could give a lesson on the four parts, uh, the four using four of the elements. And you could teach people that in relationship to their meditation, this is a nice section to take and memorize because each one of the paragraphs is set up the same way. And it's talking first about the earth, then the water, then the fire, then the air, and then even the space. It talks about that. And you do not, if you do not get upset, then agreeable and dis with di agreeable and disagreeable contacts will not invade your mind and they won't remain. Okay, so that came out of that sutta, and that is a very, very good lesson. And now we look at the hindrances, your, your actual attitude about the hindrances, hindrance attitude. Well, this is not really talking about that, and we should probably put it in there. Maybe May can take a note for me and, and, and look at this one. The hindrances goes right into the fact that hindrances have nutriment. This is the secret information. Shh. Okay. Hindrances have nutriment. That's food. Removal of that nutriment neutralizes the hindrance and it will fade away. How do hindrances work? How do they arise? What makes them bigger, stronger, and stay longer? Hindrances feed on our personal attention. This is an absolute rule. There's no exception. Strong hindrance management. Text sources like the Alagadupama Sutta, the simile of the snake, Majjhima Nikaya number 22, section six, points out obstacles will only become obstructions when we engage in them. That was the lesson. Go back to the Bayabharawa Sutta, fear and dread. Majjhima Nikaya number four, bring up a contradiction to replace the hindrance. That was the one where the monks are having a problem because they're afraid to go in the forest. So I went in without fear and sat there and accepted the forest and worked with Metta and I wasn't afraid. See, he, he's playing the opposite game for the management. He's letting it go and replacing it. The Upakalesa Sutta Imperfections, Majjhima Nikaya number 128, section 16 through 30, Example number 11, the hindrances with the solution uh, of abandonment. Every single one that is in that sutta, the whole message is about abandonment of the sutta. And you remember, you remember your pattern for the solution was 
to purify the mind and then retrain it. So when you abandon it, you have to replace it. So in Bayabarawa, he lets it go and replaces it. And in this sutta, they abandon it and come back with a, a, a pure state of mind and interest in what they're doing in their meditation and it straightens out. Letting go of distress and coming back with interest and curiosity the right way. Also the Bojanga section, this is brilliant, this section. Bojanga Samyutta Nikaya, begin on page 1597 in the single volume uh, wisdom publication of the Samyutta Nikaya, okay, Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. And that's the one that explains why without any argument, this thing about nutriment and food is true because you cannot have the enlightenment factors arise unless uh, if you feed the hindrance, the what happens, feed it your personal attention, it's absolutely true that all of those seven enlightenment factors will not arise and come into balance. So you cannot go into cessation, that, that's why. But if you abandon them, then they will arise and come into balance. And in that sutta, they call it careless attention, meaning you paid attention. If you give it careless attention to the hindrance, and it's, talking about the five hindrances, the core ones. Um, so the, it's a repetitive discussion that the, the, the paragraph is there and it happens seven times. Once again, it's a decent place to try memorization because of the repetition, it's okay. Um, and it has two sides. The first version of doing this seven, seven times for one for each of the enlightenment factors in the discussion it shows you how they won't arise. And the second one, it shows you how they will arise if you uh, abandon it, okay? Okay, section 10 here, your longing attitude, longing is a distraction. It's very important to understand. It, it always will stop everything. It'll always just stop everything going down the path. When you get obsessed and where it usually happens is you're back in uh, nothingness, um, not usually disturbing you in infinite space, infinite consciousness, but in nothingness, this is bothering you. There's a longing, pulling thing underneath you that is saying this has to happen, okay? If you desire to repeat a prior experience it won't happen. This is a guarantee. This is a fact. If you want it, you can't have that happen. It's just irritating, especially for people that have a really great, you know, thing with uplifted joint. It felt so good. And then they try for the next two days to have what happened on Monday happen again. And they keep coming in distressed. And I keep saying, you know, if you want it, you can't have it. It absolutely won't happen again. Why? Because you're moving, you're moving on the life continuum line very slowly along like this see you are um you're moving like that and so you went past that experience and so every single experience is totally different okay very basically if you want it you can't have it so it's best to sit each time only to see what happens next if you have that attitude two-year-old class number 101 <laughs> You know, if I want it, I can't have it. <laughs> you know, that's what it is. It's like this. Um, and you sit with it. Two-year-old mentality in the nursery school is, oh, look at that. Oh, wow. Here's a bowl. That's cool. Wow. And he's got this in this hand and he finds this and he says, oh, but look at this. Why? Look at this. What's this? Oh, wow. And then he goes, oh, look, what, what's this? This is like on my desk, you know. <laughs> You should have a two-year-old in here. <laughs> so they go from one thing to another and they're never tired of doing it. They jump around. But that's the thing. They want to see what happens next. What happens next? They're always curious. And we lose it as adults. We, our mind changes and we're full of a book now. And when something happens, this is why the reactions happen so much. 
we have a book full of reactions from our whole life. We're 50 years old and we decide to do meditation. We haven't got a chance. Something happens. We definitely are going to do the same thing we did when we were 16 or 14 years old. It's We've been doing it every time. If anything looks like what happened before, we same reaction. It's a pity. But you can get past it if you understand what's happening. It changes. Next one, your mindfulness attitude this minds this is minds observation it's attention this is what this is the mindfulness is the observation skill minds attention actually moves impersonally it does that a lot inside your head you're not directing it you know and you do have a lot of thoughts which just pop up from the brain it fires off all the time it runs the whole body all the different systems in the body, but it has a lot to do. When we understand this law, though, it can be very empowering for us because we can change our mind through the practice of purification and retraining that we do in right effort. And when we decide to change our experience in this existence, we learn that this begins with mind's intention. We have power over the intention. We can, we can determine why we're gonna do something and go in a particular direction this way or that way. We can do that, okay? Now, I found something earlier today, I was talking with May uh, and uh, we were looking, oh boy, I don't know if I'm gonna find him again, but I think I found him in this book. Um, and what it was, was a list of places to go online uh, May, did you write those down? Do you remember? Uh, yes, Mr. Kema. Do you uh, have them? Can you read them to them? What I'm going to give you that is really important is um, when you are practicing meditation and you're um, changing your mind, how it's actually working in line with the research that's happening right now. May, can you just read what you took notes on that? Those, um, these yeah. are the list, these are the things that you can go to YouTube. There's five titles every once in a while. I go on YouTube to find the most recent summaries on what's happening about changing a habit or changing the way your mind is reacting. And the research matches our practice perfectly. So May, what are those? Can you tell us about that? Um, yep, so the first one is Neuroscience of Behavior Change by UCLA. Um, then the second one is How to Change Neural Pathways and Build Behavior Patterns. Number three discover how to rewire your brain with neuroplasticity. Number four, self-consistency, new neural pathways. Number five, how to create new neural pathways. So oh, actually what it means is I missed out on getting a lot of money for finding this. <laughs> All these people are making tons of money with this research on this one little subject. And we've been talking about it for years and we missed. <laughs> so now they're, they're talking about discovering that your behavioral patterns are connected to neural pathways in your brain. And up till about 10 years ago, something like that, we honestly believed if you were behaving a particular pattern that was not very acceptable or giving you problems in life, you're stuck with it for the rest of your life because you're an adult and you can't change. But now they know that this is not the case because they know more and more. And the interesting story about how this happened, it comes to the history of the MRI equipment and taking pictures of your brain and the development of the cameras uh, every so many years, they upgrade the development of these cameras and they have these different formats for MRIs in the brain. And so they got to a point where they could actually see these neural pathways more closely. And the interesting part of the, about the development of the cameras and the MRI equipment was it was in line with the development at the same time, the information that helped them to do this 
was happening from NASA uh, developing the new telescopes that could go and look deeper and deeper and deeper in space. And so they had more powerful technology to be able to do this. So what they see are these little tiny strands. I'll, I'll show you. Well, actually, I'm not going to do the whiteboard, I guess, right now, because this this is up here, I'll get all confused. But if you draw a little circle and pretend it's your head, and then you have little strands of lines coming out of your head, like it uh, looks like this, you know, coming out of your head like that. And all these little strands, each one of these fingers is a neural pathway in your brain, you can pretend. And there's one fat one, you know, like this. And this fat one, this one, okay, is your anger strand for a neural pathway for your anger reaction. And if you have anger management problem, that neural pathway, they say, is, is fat because you use it all the time, but the other ones are skinny. And so they figured out that if you don't use that pathway, it sort of dries up, curls up, cracks off and falls away. And you, if you choose loving kindness and you've started practicing and you don't use that pathway for anger anymore, then what happens is it one falls off and the other one is just a tiny little, you have to be careful. You have to keep practicing the loving kindness and the compassion because those little strands are very like little footpaths. And this one was like a sidewalk that had been made out of cement in your head for years. Okay. But if you keep going and teaching your brain, the whole point is you can teach your brain. And the discovery of this thing about neuroplasticity and the brain and neural pathways is like should have on the front of the book hope and it means hope for change and if you put your mind to it it's it's more and more work after the age of 25 it gets more and more you have to pay attention to it all the time but if we're giving you this practice and we're saying this is the practice you replace it with you are, you've got the replacement, you've got the loving kindness, the compassion, the joy and the equanimity to replace this other reactionary one. That's really good news. This is really, really good news. So the mindfulness attitude, your mind's attention actually moves in personally. We understand, uh, we, when we understand this law, it can be very empowering to us because we can change our mind through the practice of purification and retraining in right effort. And when we decide to change our experience in uh, this existence, we learn that this begins with mind's attention. It's the control room for everything. And that change your mind, you change your life. And actively becoming aware of this and then practicing it, we confirm by observation, by experience and observation that nothing is happening to us. Once again, everything is happening from us. And it becomes a very powerful tool that determines how well you can just more or less sit back and watch instead of jumping in and reacting. Everything changes for you. Um, the last one was comprehension attitude. And the reason we put that one in there was because of the modes of progress. And the modes of progress are found in uh, 28, I think 2810. And that is in the Diginakaya, Diginakaya number 28 um, in section 10, right? In the Diginakaya. And that modes of progress, um, we had to put this in here about comprehension. You don't have to uh, over understand what all of this is about. This is something I wanna to stress to you all. That was, Buddhism got very overwhelming and one person was standing beside me at a huge conference once where the conference was constantly talking about 587 million Buddhists on the, in the world and how big this is we started out first 10 years before is 328 million. Now we have 400 million, 520. And the guy, the, the monk next to me, he's just said, they never count how many are coming and how many are leaving. They only count how many are coming. <laughs> and I, I thought about that. It's stuck in my mind, okay? They don't do statistics on who's leaving. So the issue is um, 
why are they leaving? Because some of what the way we treat it today seems so overwhelming to many pieces and everything and so much more complicated than it has to be. But it isn't something that should be looked upon like that. Because if you're trained gradually by using something that you feel the results right away by using the, 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 the steps of right effort, you begin to learn the pieces and gradually these stuff does really come together and it makes a quilt like this. It comes together and it's all one piece. But you should not, uh, don't have to over understand what all this is about and keep analyzing, analyzing. Just learn the difference between knowledge and vision and knowledge and wisdom. You don't have to, knowledge and vision means knowing it happens first and then later on you continue on to attain knowledge and wisdom knowledge and vision is like a foundation stone so don't go for over learning this information or over analyzing it because it won't help you it is far more important to see personally how everything works in your meditation your practice time but not just your sitting practice that's the big thing about this particular approach to meditation. This is in your pocket at the store, at, it's at the stop sign. And when you run out of gas, it's there all the time with everything you do and using it that way. And letting people, people see you laugh at the situation where everybody else is just getting annoyed and everything. Come on, this is okay. It's going to change. Knowledge and vision is the same as direct knowledge. This is one thing I've determined in the text. When it says direct knowledge, it's talking about you having direct knowledge by seeing it. That's what the Buddha is pushing here. It means knowing by watching and seeing clearly how dependent origination works in action within your meditation sessions and all the time in life. Whenever something arises, the question should not be, why did this come up, leading us into a vast net of mental proliferation and doubt, or even a, um, a big thing that came up, <laughs> or even a retro investigation into the past and analysis of a distraction. Uh, this can go on for a seemingly endless amount of time that people can be wrapped up in this. But the question should be, how did this distraction come up? And how can the remainderless fading away and cessation of it occur? And so if you are not being told about the food and the nutriment and how the uh, habit, uh, how the habitual tendency of the hindrance operates, you're not getting the information you need to just understand, leave it alone, abandon it. And there was that nursery rhyme about the... Mm, this, the uh, leave them alone. It's something about, um, let's see, the lambs that went to school one day and followed Mary to school one day, the, one of the nursery rhymes. And the phrase is, leave them alone and they'll go home. And it sticks, that should stick in your mind. If you leave the hindrance alone, they'll just go home. They won't stay there and have tea and bother you, even though you don't want them in the house. They'll just go home. How can the remainderless fading away and cessation of it occur? This will happen through the ongoing continuous practice of right, right effort. Now, then you can look at these other things um, on when I give you this document. Uh, you know, there's a lot more here. Um, and the other information that was stuck on this document when, when this was put out, a real problem with mental proliferation, uh, can we decide to just keep mental proliferation at the at, at check right at the inception or what should we do? And there was a, a big thing about this. And then uh, another person noticed that even when radiating met it to people or any other living things, as soon as I start to pay more attention to someone, I get many associated memories that instantly put my attention away from my object of meditation. What's happening is dependent origination is cycling like like a, um, a coil, a circle that goes in, goes in, keeps producing another circle and another circle. And the person is caught in a whirlpool of things. There was a comment on that. And then I found that it helps a lot. If I take a light attitude towards uh, those that I am radiating meta to by not getting involved in any thoughts and simply keep radiating the feeling to progress down the path, that's correct. 
and as I give out metta, I feel there's a benefit of some kind. How does practicing the Brahma Viharas help my practice in the future? Well, this is an interesting question, but when you're practicing this train, we using this training, if you were if you went back later to do a breathing like a retreat and you wanted to sit there with the breathing, all you need to do is pay attention to the part about the hindrances. And by the time if you've done this for a few months. When you go back, you'll be lighter. Do not just remember that the object of meditation doesn't have anything for you. And you have to keep lightly, keep away and remember what the object of meditation is for. It's an anchor for you to come back if you had to go let something go because you have the secret. The other people, it's not a secret, but you understand how this works about the purification of your mind and the retraining of your mind. Now you have that right effort operating correctly where the people around you are still trying, they're trying to follow the rise and fall or the feeling or this or that with the breathing. You can sit with them, it's fine. And you, I, my, I was kidding around with May earlier, so she put, be sure you sit near the back of the wall or on the edge so that when you start smiling, you can look at the wall, but you can smile and hopefully they'll get it. That smiling is very an uplifting thing, but sometimes a lot of people in breathing meditation, sometimes they don't smile. Nobody taught them about the brain opening and the connection of these muscles to the brain. So they, they aren't doing it. And if they ask you, why are you smiling? Tell them about the muscles <laughs> because this is true and they can validate it with anybody they talk to with anatomy. Do not be afraid of cessation of, ex of existence in the Baba Niroda. This was another thing about, um, we had a discussion about. So there's this stuff is written about, you can ask me about it if you have any questions, but that was all about this document. So. Um, I, I originally this was done in uh, the conclusion of that retreat. Now there might be another document I can't find where there was refined after that, but um, these are the basic structures that came down. One of the things at the end of this break, this examination for two or three days it took was can't we say that karma is absolute? Well, the thing about karma, it's not really part of your your um, in, involved in the meditation subject matter. You know, karma is a, something that functions in the universe and it is absolute the way it operates, that's true. But when we were looking for absolutes, we were looking for the absolutes that were directly affecting the meditation practice, okay? That's what we were talking about. Um, so we didn't include it. That's one of the reasons we didn't. I would like some feedback from you guys. Let me get back. How do we do the stop the sharing here? Um, get some feedback from you, from any of you on questions on these pieces. But the idea behind going at this way was if you are um, setting yourself up with the correct knowledge and you are prepared to go into your meditation with an understanding of how the hindrances are working. And one friend, one person uh, also, last week, one person was talking to me about problems with their meditation. And, you know, it's just too noisy here. I can't do it. I keep getting, and I said, you know, when I was training with Bhante in the beginning, he did some unmerciful things at times <laughs> and would say in the midst of an airport or a train station, now sit in your meditation. And in Asia, we came across uh, in different places. We went monks that would sit in the middle of a street in the city in, and they would meditate. And people think that doesn't happen. Oh, yes, it does. And what they're doing, I'm not sure if they're how, exactly how they're working. But with us, it was a matter of um, he would do it to you and say in a noisy place, sit, go ahead, sit. Because he kept wanting us to let sound go so that even if there was a bang or this or that and we had an interesting experience we wouldn't even move we wouldn't even have any internal reaction to the sound and one specific case in florida um, there was a great big house that we were staying at and then some uh, the people came um, from the university to sit there were four people and we were all sitting in fourth 
third or fourth jhana. So pretty good equanimity, you know, it's beginning to feel that equanimity, getting deep and having longer sets. This is like about a two hour set and about an hour, maybe over an hour into the set, uh, there was a cat <laughs> and the cat went in the kitchen and he knocked the lid off of the metal trash can to hit the marble floor in a large high ceiling where everything just went, <sighs> you see, on the floor. And the funny part was Bonte was watching us and we came out about 30 minutes later, we came out of the sitting and he said, so let's talk about what happened. And only one person was less of a meditator, had jarred and gotten disturbed, but he hung it out. He stuck with it and grabbed onto it and stayed in the meditation. For the more advanced people, was very interesting to hear each one of us say what happened in the dark, deep in uh, the nothingness, you know, that level, what happened. And so, my thing was I could see the vibration go and I was amazed at seeing the vibration go and then it was gone. Not color, not pattern, just in the dark, this vibration, like you would send a wave through and it would vibrate and just through and it was gone, but there was no concern. And the other part about that was the actual hearing he questioned us about, questioned us about it. The, the way to describe it was you were in a cave and the opening was up here and you were sitting way inside the cave, you see, way, um, way down here inside and the opening was up there, okay? So it happened outside the cave. So it was just a small sound way far away and then it faded away. Another person had a, a color shot of hot pink that went across when it happened. And it went like like a vibrating thing across the screen in front of them. Another person didn't have almost anything. She was even deeper, that person. So di different ways this translated, but not nobody moved the bodies at all. He said we were doing really well, that we didn't even, didn't even move the slightest bit. And that was a sound re reaction, but there was no concern for the sound whatsoever because we had enough training to understand a sound is just a sound. So what this is, is a practice of a sound is just a sound. So I used to like to go um, in town and then stop by a lumber mill where all the equipment is going and sit on the porch by where the one market is right beside the lumber place and listen to all this noise and just hang out for a little while on a bench and see what happened. And can it disappear? Also, if you're sitting in a place, you're living in a place next to a big waterfall, what happens? How do you deal with the sound of this huge rushing water next to you? You become part of it, just the way somebody who lives next to, buys a, 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 a is get, rents an apartment that's right next to a railroad track, but you didn't know it. And then you think, oh, what have I done? And then all of a sudden in a short time, it's not disturbing at all. It becomes part of you. So we're kind of unique as human beings that we can adjust like this. And I think that's kind of neat that we can do that. Yeah. So what did you think about this? Do you think that this was helpful? And if so, we can, um, I want to hear from you guys and uh, I want to know, um, do you want to take apart 111 in detail to see how we broke that whole entire thing down? Because that one is very informative. Okay. Anybody? I, I, I. <laughs> Anybody? What did you think about this? Yes. Did you, mm -hmm. Ulysses? Yeah, I, 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 I really liked it because it provides like a firewall, you know, like a firewall, you know, you know, going into the meditation exactly what to expect and, and, and then how you prepare yourself for it. You, you're not just sitting in there, you know, um, not knowing what to expect and then not knowing how to deal with it. But also uh, you, you mentioned the, the precepts first and definitely the precepts is a, is a big issue because if, we, if that's what we're uh, nurturing, that's what's, what's going to come up in the meditation as well. 
as a, as a, as a distraction from the attention, you know, the attention of the distraction. So um, I, I encountered this because, as you know, yesterday I, I did a session with my family. Of course, it was a short one. It was an introductory one. And they all talked about this. This, they, this is all they wanted to talk about, these distractions and how they dealt with them in the, in the time that they did it. Um, and I, I almost wish that I had done this session today before I did the one with my family because that would have given me a nice refresher. But, um, but that was, that was the, yeah, this, definitely the way it is laid out. And I would love to have the paper that you put in today because I would like to like yeah. um, have it there for, for reference because yeah. that was very, very, very useful. Yeah, I, um, the, you know, having some kind of like set, set laws, right? Um, that you know is going to be always the same, even if our experience of meditation is different, right? Because we all have different meditations each time. Uh, or the experience of meditation is different, but the, the 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 framework is the same every single time. Yeah, it's really important. I'm especially proud of you, Ulysses. I just want everybody to go. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Ulysses is, is is from New York City. He's down with his family in Costa Rica, and he's been doing some amazing work that sort of unintentional almost. And one of the most marvelous things that's happened, I wanted to tell Dr. Perel, is like his, is your cousin, right? It has Asperger's, yeah, cousin? No, my, 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 my brother, my youngest brother has Asperger's. Youngest brother, and, and has yeah. the Asperger's. And the Asperger's, like I said to you the other day, was similar to panic attack. And by just sitting with him a couple times with Ulysses and learning this meditation, it was uh, like giving him a uh, an anchor, giving him an anchor that, you know, you, you have you ever worked, uh, Perel, have you ever worked with people with stuttering and they teach it if you're, you have your family uh, is taught to assist you or a friend hanging out with you. So if you give a speech and they'll say, check it, check it. And this is check it, it means stop the stuttering and then start again in speech pathology. Well, this is like in Asperger's, when you go into this, the syndrome, the withdrawal and you lock up and you and the next thing is you wanna leave the room and go away from people. And this gave him uh, this, this thing, it's a wonderful thing. I wish there was an Asperger's foundation where we could tell Ulysses to go and show this to them because it was amazing what happened to him. He's 35 years old and he's been through five, six years of therapy or more. Nobody could get this to calm him down or to have him stay in the room or continue, you know? He just wanted to run and not away. Only, not, 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 only that, but, not only that, but nobody understood his situation. Nobody understood how he actually feels and why there have been some really strange behaviors and, and choices that he's made that has turned the family against him. And um, the, um, you know, uh, me included, because I, I, I just heard the, the horrible stories, right? And then when, okay. when we had a chance to talk, I said to him, uh, would you be interested in, in doing a little bit of meditation? We actually only did about five to 10 minutes the first time. And it was, you know, I know that's not what we normally would do. We would do a lot more, but it was just the beginning. And, and when he felt that everything was turned off, basically that mountain of anxiety that he was, he was feeling disappear and he says i can't believe it you know this is the first time i feel like a real person and then the, and your mother, what this led to your mother, this, your, your mother had a reaction to it she started crying she was so excited yeah yes and then and then and then the thing is the, the interesting thing is the the rest of the family started noticing it very quickly because things that will normally pop up in general uh day-to-day -day living had disappeared uh, there was more of a generous feeling about it. There was more of a welcoming feeling about it. He was not being as, he didn't, he didn't appear as selfish as before. And th suddenly I get uh, my, my other family members saying, hey, we need to have a session for everyone because this is not just something that he can benefit from. And so yesterday I had 19 people in a, in a big patio <laughs> under the stars <laughs> and um and we were able to to work on this and um everybody had different things that they were dealing with but it was just a beautiful thing but it was all because of my brother and i really i actually thank him uh for giving me the opportunity to to share because um it, I yeah think and it, you it you amazing. you already you also discovered the spanish website through damasuka that um adrian had built 
He's from Quito, Ecuador, and he had built the Spanish uh, website many years ago. I worked with him on that when I was back at Damasuka. And so we, we, that's still there. And, he, and, and Adrian had done a lot of translation work on articles and things. So we were able to give Ulysses um, you know, basic things that he could use for his meeting and show him how to do a one hour presentation like Bonte did. I didn't know, did you show them Bonte giving a talk or not? I don't know if you did. Uh, no, I didn't do that because um, it is in English, like the, the Bantis, uh, you know, him talking, it would be in English and the subtitles would have been too small for them to read. Oh, so so yeah. we didn't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what we did was um, we did the um, PowerPoint presentation that you have posted. Yeah, I translated it into Spanish uh, as best as I could. And um, and then uh, we had we had a presentation of that and then they, they had the practice for 20 minutes. And then after yeah. that, we had um, a sharing, everybody shared. And then we had a convivial where everybody was able to talk to each other. It was very beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Really beautiful. I'm so proud of you. It makes me so happy that this was happening, you know, just great. It's wonderful. So we have a, he's, I don't know if how long you're going to stay in Costa Rica. You better be careful. The whole town is going to want to come up now. You, you have a whole room full of people that are changing. <laughs> They're all going to come and want to have a bigger meeting. <laughs> uh, I, I might have to set, set up my own my own um, you know property here to start doing these things. <laughs> yeah, anyway, I was thinking when you yeah. said that I was going to call you back tonight and I was going to say you know yeah you, you know what to do with that property. It's like the one what is it one <laughs> acre or something like that. You now what you do is set what up is a it? meditation yeah. center where everybody can come learn this. this is really great. We never got to South America before my Spanish is, I was always hoping I would, and it just didn't materialize. But I always told Adrian never to give up that it can always happen at, possibly at some point. I'll get brave. My actual Spanish is not that bad, but now we have Ulysses <laughs> and this is great news, you know? So this is wonderful. Anybody else about this, what we just did, did it, did it seem to, help you for preparation about your practice? Hmm? Okay, so many things are happening. Um, you know, there was a board meeting, well, a, get, a group of people interested who's, who we're gonna try real hard to try to get a trust together for, or, or a or more organization for TWIM in India and uh, you know anybody interested in uh, in talking to someone about whether they can help um, maybe if you get in touch with me or with Bhante Damagavesi uh, but I think we have a good group of people I really do and I'm I'm this is wonderful I'm terrified step back step back step back because <laughs> I never get to step back and let people really do something and when Perel was talking at the meeting yesterday, I was thinking, oh gosh, now I really have to go then. <laughs> you know? So that's good because I uh, just the way that it has been for a nun, it's, it's not as easy for a nun because uh, it's easy for the monks, but it's not easier for the nuns to find the support and to find, uh, to be able to step back and let people do everything for you is kind of difficult for us. And, and, you know, in the monk situation uh, with uh, Buddhism, if a monk is in a place and they don't like the way that place is operating, it's not big of a deal. You, you, you hike over to the other place and the other place and the other place. And the nuns have been working on this for years, but, um, you know, it's getting better. There are more places, but it's still difficult in the countries over here. It is still hard. You know, and I, I don't want to be moving around. <laughs> I don't want. I want to be staying in uh, one basic spot. But still, I am met monastic uh, so many years. There's definitely my feet, and then there's the sand under the feet, and I keep, uh, you know, wanting to move around sometimes because people are asking for me in different places. But I, I want to thank you all for uh, all the help that we had at those meetings, the meeting, and. We all have little assignments to do for the next meeting and we'll see what happens as we put this together. I got volunteers today to help me put a bunch of emails together and somebody called and said they would help me 
to go through and, and make a whole uh, book up of everything. Anybody met me, anybody exposed to me, they gave me their number, here it comes back. <laughs> That's about that way. So they said, let's make a list of everything we have. So we're gonna try to do that. And then we're gonna try to keep a book and keep track of what we're actually doing much better. Cause when they mentioned that, I thought to my side, oh no, if I go backwards, I can tell you everything I've taught over all the weeks and everything. I have a diary, but sometimes I don't put it in there. But uh, for the weeks and weeks since uh, COVID happened, it's been good for us because we've started to work on Wednesdays and Saturdays and now on Wednesday, Saturday and Sunday. So very good. So if you all ready, we want to go now. Okay. And um, we'll give a blessing and then uh, I will see you again on uh, Saturday and next week. I think I can tell them ahead of time, Bonte, that next week we will do a, a similar analysis thing with the using uh, MN 111 in May. You can look at it because I sent it to you and, and see because every single, when you really want to know what we're doing and the mind, how the mind was for Sariputta, how everything structurally was operating for him and how it was working. This that I did, I don't know when I did it, but I know I did it very carefully and took every single thing because I wanted to prove the worth of this sutta is very precious because it shows exactly how his mind was operating and what he was happening step by step that he was seeing arise and pass away. It's a beautiful sutta. And the thing is, in our practice, we know this sutta is very real because that is our practice and aware jhana that practices the samatha and the vipassana is happening in conjunction with it, popping out, trying to say, wow, that's what this is. And then go back and keep going. That's what we're doing with the insights, you see? Okay, here we go. Mm -hmm. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Say sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.